So I'll go ahead and uh, introduce Ralph Langner. It gives me uh, he, uh, really excited to have him here with us today. Um, he came in for, from Germany for this and, uh, of course, some other meetings as well. As uh, Ralph just told me, Washington is becoming the cybersecurity capital these days because of so much interest in uh, cybersecurity policy that's going on right now. Um, Ralph is a guy who was talking about cyber war before anybody knew that was a thing, really. He um, has been working in the space for about 25 years or so, um, and specifically around control systems and critical infrastructure. Um, I guess Ralph uh, also uh, gained notoriety in the press with, uh, when he started poking around in something that became known as Stuxnet and really was the, one of the first people, or the first, who called it a weapon and really figured out what it was, uh, what was, what it was all about. Uh, this was long before there were books and documentaries about Stuxnet and the idea of cyber war. Uh, so without further ado, I'm going to invite Ralph up here. He's, uh, he's going to have a talk, and then we'll come up, and I'll come back up and uh, we'll have a uh, further conversation. Thanks, Ralph. Good morning. Before I start, um, I would like to take the opportunity to honor Mark Clayton, former staff uh, writer for the Christian Science Monitor. Unfortunately, Mark passed away. Uh, Mark was uh, the first journalist who broke my story on Stuxnet, and I think it's worthwhile pointing it out because at the time it, it, it took a lot of courage. When I um, wrote on my blog that um, Stuxnet was a, a cyber physical attack against the Iranian nuclear program, it seemed just too bizarre. Nobody would believe that. And then uh, Mark interviewed me and had the guts to really break the story. And after that, now uh, it appears to be, yeah, sure, sure it was a cyber physical attack against the Iranian nuclear program. We know, we know that. We have read it in the New York Times, et cetera, in the Washington Post, but Mark was the first and was in the Christian Science Monitor. Um, so I just uh, imagine that uh, he is better off today because I, I know he was a good Christian. Um, what I would like to talk about today is uh, give you a little bit more transparency, transparency of what we refer to as the Internet of Things, um, because I think that uh, we are going to be in deep trouble if we um, don't differentiate a little bit better what we are talking about. We have quite different cybersecurity problems with what is referred to as the IoT. Many people imagine the IoT as one homogeneous space, maybe driven by the uh, thought that, well, it's all about physical objects. So here is cyber, and there is the physical objects, and so when we bring those together, we have the Internet of Things, and uh, that ranges from, like, um, uh, wristbands connected to the Internet to nuclear power plants, aircraft, uh, automobile, automobiles, etc. So that is the, um, the new modern narrative. And I believe that's um, a misleading narrative because there are quite some substantial differences between all those things. Certainly what happened was that the, that the term IoT caught on. So I did a quick Google um, Trends search um, for this talk. The yellow line that you see is a uh, search request for the term IoT. Uh, what you can also see that, that, that this by far exceeds the interest in uh, the industrial internet, uh, which is the blue line. Actually, you cannot even see the blue line. Um, IoT is the green line, also flat at the bottom. And one thing shows up, it's, it's industry 4.0 is like the German term for IIoT. So obviously the Germans did a better marketing job for um, their program, for their industrial internet program. So IIoT is just, uh, uh, excuse me, IoT is going through the roof, generates a lot of interest. And uh, again, this uh, has little to do with what's going on in the industrial control system space. What I try to do here is map that whole universe of things. So as I see it, we have two opposite ends of it. On the left end, we have consumer goods. 
And actually, when you, um, when you look at what certain standards bodies are doing, like the, um, IO, um, uh, the Industrial Internet Consortium, they are specifically referring to the IoT as consumer goods and not industrial control systems, industrial machinery. So uh, I place the, the wearables and the home automation and the cars on the left end of the spectrum. And on the right end of the spectrum, we have critical infrastructure, factory automation, et cetera. And the one thing that is a big dividing line here is where, where industrial control systems come in. Because once that you have industrial control systems, you're talking about real-time process control. You don't need real-time process control for your toilet seat yet that you connect to the internet because you think that's a fancy thing to do, or for your car. You don't need real-time control. Um, but that is different in the factory automation environment. In home automation, it's just starting a little bit. So for example, when you think about your HVAC at home and you, when you think about the uh, motors that are involved to um, close your, your shades, that is not real-time. Um, in factory automation, this is different. Certainly also passenger airplanes, uh, that involves real-time process control too. And um, I have also included military installations like uh, weapon systems, surveillance si systems, or warships, because guess what? They're using the very same products as the civilian sector. Same cybersecurity problems in the military. Um, one other thing that I try to visualize here in that, in that diagram is that what really gets new with the IIoT, with the industrial internet of things, is the concept that we connect a whole bunch of factory automation systems to the internet in order to create cyber-physical superstructures. A typical example would be the smart grid. Uh, another typical example is the uh, industrial internet in the nearer sense where the idea is to, um, to connect and to coordinate whole supply chains so that your supply chain pretty much moves in real time and on demand. So far, the military was smart enough to not jump on the concept. Uh, so far, they are not eager to participate in those cyber-physical superstructures. Why are they smart? Because certainly those superstructures come with a whole new level of risk. And um, most of that risk is associated with uh, physical dependencies. And this is something I'm going to dive in in my talk in a couple of sec seconds. When you consider consumer goods, the wearables, for example, the home automation, you don't have emergent effects. So for example, you don't have ripple effects. You don't have butterfly effects. Because every installation is... Um, not physically dependent on every other installation. Like when uh, your um, home automation malfunctions, your HVAC, and you might have to light up your fireplace. And uh, if that also happens at your neighbor's place, it's not that the risk or, or the damage would all of a sudden multiply. But that's, that is different in the industrial realm and a critical infrastructure, because we have those physical interdependencies. And I'm going to focus on that in a minute. But first, let's look at some industrial things, physical objects that are controlled by cyber. Okay? So obviously, those things are a bit different than your uh, smartwatch, your smoke detector at home, um, because most of them are pretty big pieces of metal. And um, we refer to them as actuators because they perform some function, some physical function. In a factory environment, this is embedded and in, integrated in some real-time process, in a physical process. And that's the big difference to home automation. That's the big difference to the IoT in the nearer sense. So just imagine for a second 
that one of these things uh, would present you a message like this. What would you think if one of your motors, one of your pumps, one of your valves prompts you to uh, tell Google, well, it's okay uh, to share the location? Obviously, you would not be happy about such a message, right? Um, what about this? This reflects more to real-world plans, what the IIoT could be that the vendors are able to sell you some add-on functionality on demand, okay? So the um, capabilities of your physical products, of your actuators, of your pumps, of your turbines, etc., could be supercharged when the need in, um, pops up just by swiping your credit card and you can buy some additional or added service. And again, so this is what, what you see here is a bit more realistic. This is going to happen. But what about if then this happens? We just learned recently that the internet isn't as reliable as everybody thought. So in other words, uh, we are creating strong dependencies on the internet under the impression, well, it used to work for the last decade, right? You're using it all the time for all types of purposes, so we take it for granted. But at least we took it for granted until last week. So hopefully this, was, this, this changed the minds of many people. Um, so the, the problem that I tr want to focus on is this mesh this mesh of dependencies, of digital and analog dependencies. So the, the risk that you're talking about in critical infrastructure, in the industrial realm, is not a property of a thing, of an isolated thing. The risk is in the, in the functional cyber-physical mesh. And that's something that you don't have with the consumer goods. And that's the, the, the prime reason why in the industrial realm and in critical infrastructure, the risk is so much higher. Because this mesh creates all those, all the, the, the opportunity for all those side effects, the ripple effects, the butterfly effects. Let me um, get into more detail. So, as I said, the big thing in industrial automation is process control. No engineer on the planet thinks of a valve or a motor as a thing. Every engineer thinks of it as an actuator with a specific function in the real-time physical process. This is one reason why the term IoT or even IIoT really doesn't catch on that well with engineers because they think process, they think real time, they think reliability, certainly also safety. So let's look at some second order effects. Uh, the, the, fir the first order effects are trivial. So once that I'm able to compromise the control logic or um, the command interface, to an actuator, certainly I can manipulate its behavior. But now let's look at some interesting second order effects. So I'll be talking about digital, digital analog effects, which I believe is very important because um, in factory automation, what the attacker is really interested in is getting into the trust chain. This is, by the way, how you jump the air gap to hit the high value targets. It's about the trust chain. I'll give you some examples for that. Uh, then we'll talk about digital analog, digital second order effects. And we have those, especially with all those physical um, requirements that cyber systems have. Uh, very simple, they need electricity and they also need cooling, okay? So once that you're able to mess with those um, requirements, you can take down 
the cyber systems or the, the computers, the IT equipment, whatever you want. And finally, I'll discuss some digital analog, analog second order effects, which I refer to as physical vulnerabilities, which are as important as the um, IT vulnerabilities in that space. So uh, let's look at some uh, at, a, at an interesting digital digital analog effect. So with, with analog, I mean physical, the physical reality, physical space, real time. Um, there was an interesting incident a couple of years ago in a nuclear power plant in the United States. The power plant all of a sudden experienced an emergency shutdown, which means in a couple of seconds, bam, power down. Um, and the reason, as it was investigated, was an administrator was installing new software on a, on a server that was residing in the enterprise network. And while doing that, he was rebooting that server. And that was the cause of the scram, of the reactor scram. Well, certainly that, that seemed to be um, unexpected. Uh, the, the reason was that, that this enterprise server um, delivered some data um, that was associated with what we call a trip signal. So a trip signal uh, for protection and safety systems is this is one of the, the signals of the messages when, when you trigger that, bang, it's, it's, uh, the, uh, the, the installation is uh, brought to a safe state. So how could that be? Well, it was uh, intentional. Unfortunately, it wasn't really well designed, and it certainly was not documented. And this is one of the, the typical issues that uh, you find all over the place. Way before people started to talk about something like the Industrial Internet of Things. So already presently, we have all those hidden digital dependencies, even in nuclear power plants. Don't get me wrong, this wasn't a safety risk because the plant was shut down in a safe manner. Only cost the asset owner a million bucks because this is the price tag for shutting down a new plant and powering it up again. Um, that was unexpected. And certainly if you increase the digital complexity, you are going to have uh, some more surprise effects. Um, now let's look at a different area, digital analog digital effects, which means um, somebody messes with those physical requirements of your IT equipment. That happened last year in Ukraine. You remember that um, cyber attack against the Ukrainian grid or parts of the Ukrainian grid? It was much more complex than what I'm going to focus on here. I'm focusing only on, on one interesting aspect. Um, the attackers disabled the uninterruptible power supplies of the control centers that were affected, okay? Now, since they were also able to shut down power, the control centers, the operators in the control centers, all of a sudden, found themselves without any electricity because the uninterruptible power supplies didn't work. Oh, that's bad, right? Why did they buy them in the first place? They didn't work. Okay, now here is, um, here is what, what you should take home. How was that possible? The attackers disabled the uninterruptible power supplies. I would imagine that some of you in the audience now consider, oh, you know, those super hackers from the Russians. They found a way, they, like, uh, they found that, that buffer overflow and exploited that. No, that was not the case. There was a legitimate command for current UPS products that allow you to manipulate the, the UPS via the network, to take it offline. Okay. Legitimate command. This was exploited. So I have to tell you one thing. You got to be a damn fool if you don't disable that functionality for a critical installation, like the control center for an electric grid. You got to be a damn fool. Uh, so this is my take on this. No uh, super hacking involved here, no buffer overflow, 
no reverse engineering. You just need to understand how modern uh, products work. In other words, you just need to read the manual. The exploits are in the manual. You can find them there, the vulnerabilities and ways to exploit them. Uh, so I've, I'm, uh, I've um, displayed a, a very common product that many UPS uh, manufacturers are using. Um, this is an, an interface product that allows you to connect your UPS to the network in order to monitor its status, etc., and also to manipulate the, uh, the UPS. Um, here is another, uh, for, uh, another category, the digital analog analog effect um, that I pointed out earlier this year. Um, how could you potentially cause a whole lot of trouble in a nuclear power plant? Um, so what we did is we um, carefully examined the safety documentation of a new reactor safety system design. It's used in the United States, okay? Now, safety um, analysis are published by the NRC, also by in other sectors, like in chemicals. They are publicly available. And uh, what I'm interested in is, if I look at the safety design, how can I exploit it? What is the, where are, you know, the, the holes in the design? Here is the point. Safety is a science in its own right. Safety is based on the assumption that they only look at, or that they only consider random failure. Random failure, okay? And then they have their uh, coping strategies like uh, throwing in redundancy. Because the, um, uh, the um, probability that multiple components fail simultaneously, certainly um, just goes down to near zero. However, as you all will understand, security is a completely different animal. Because when you consider intentional malicious compromise, redundancy gives you nothing. Because the attacker can and will manipulate your redundant <coughs> components simultaneously or staged or whatever needs to be done. So uh, I have illustrated this, this problem by uh, pointing out to a flaw in, in the safety design of, of this uh, uh, safety system. It's based on, on a simple idea. Um, but many people don't know, when the feed water goes back to the reactor, it, it has to be heated up. So uh, many people think, well, it's always a problem when, when the reactor overheats, so um, <clears throat> it must be cooled. That's only part of the story. The, if the feed water that goes back to the reactor gets too cold, the reactor can be shock cooled and you get a reactivity condition. And that's bad, that's really bad, because you will have a core melt in a couple of minutes. That's what we have seen in Chernobyl. Now, uh, unfortunately, this is not reflected in the safety design because it doesn't factor in a malicious cyber attack. So if the cyber attacker would simultaneously disable all the feed water preheaters, maybe at the same time open all the valves, then what you end up is, is an unanalyzed condition in safety parlance. I just hope that the NRC and the vendors take a closer look at that uh, before somebody else does. At least I made it public um, earlier this year. Um, so you can model that um, in any detail as you want. I won't go into details here. I just want to give you the idea that we really can and have to uh, analyze this further. And um, finally, to sum it up, um, also consider nth order effects. So I, I was only speaking about second order effect, but, but the, the more complex your mesh gets, uh, the, more, uh, uh, the bigger the risk for all those ripple and butterfly effects. Um, so if you think about the US electrical grid, for example, in the electrical grid in the US, you have 55,000 substations. Now, the thing is, an, an attacker who would be interested to cause a nationwide blackout doesn't have to take down all 55,000 substations. How many sub substations do they need to take down? 
Certainly the number is much less. Um, one study says nine. I don't know if it's true. I haven't verified that. I think we have Scott Aronson from EEI here in the audience. Maybe. Scott, is, is that number about? So it's, uh, that's, I think that's enough for, to highlight the problem. It is much lower than 55,000, and that's something that we need to work on. That is the, the mesh of digital and, uh, and physical uh, dependencies. So um, what I'd like to finish with is uh, to give you the idea that, that the things in process control and critical infrastructure really aren't that important when you, when you think about risk. It's the dependencies, what, what I call the cyber-physical mesh. And uh, how do we get out of this mess? Well, we can. That's the good news. Hallelujah. We can if we get our act together. Because the, all, all of these problems can be modeled. Why is that the case? First, because the physical side of things is low entropy. Um, so you don't have the, the combinatorial explosion as we have it in digital. And second, because still the number of components that we have to factor in are considerably low. Let's go back to the number 55,000. So, I mean, we can do a large scale uh, modeling and analytics. Uh, that is really something that can be done. Unfortunately, few people are working on it. Um, and uh, the final thought is that complexity, as we are eager to jump for it, now the, the IIoT and the IoT is just tremendously expanding the complexity. Um, this comes with a tough problem. It makes life so much more difficult for the defender, but so much easier for the offender. Thank you very much. Now I uh, would like to open it up for Q&A. So um, thanks very much, Ralph. Um, we have a couple of questions for you uh, before we turn it over to the audience. I was thinking if we could go back, say, a decade or so when Stuxnet was first being worked on and deployed. The threat landscape, right, is, is vastly expanded. I mean, you laid out all, many of the ways that the IoT is going into the industrial landscape. Um, I'm sure it's magnitudes of difference from a decade ago. Uh, after Stuxnet, there was a lot of talk about the son of Stuxnet, or Stuxnet yeah. 2. Have you seen in your work any indication that there, there have been sophisticated attacks like that on infrastructure? Well, uh, oh, certainly. Well, the, um, let me just say, uh, what we have seen is a bit different from what we had expected. But certainly what, what we have seen after uh, 2010 is that um, the attacks against critical infrastructure are definitely post-Stuxnet, and I'll tell you why. Um, think about the large-scale attacks against um, Telnet, uh, Telvent, for example. Uh, um, Telvent is a, manufacturer, uh, a vendor, a software vendor um, uh, who uh, produces products to control pipelines. Think about Energetic Bear. Uh, think about Black Energy. There is one common thread in all those attack campaigns. So those campaigns target not single installations like in Natanz, uh, not, not specific facilities, but they target whole industry sectors like the energy sector, uh, uh, like uh, the electric grid, uh, like pharmaceuticals, etc. And what we, what we see is that um, the, at, the attack code that is uh, infiltrated contains logic um, to gather information which makes no sense in terms of intellectual property, like you want to, um, to steal some IP in order to get a competitive advantage, etc. But it only makes sense for potential later destructive activities. I found that very concerning. Um, and this is what we see in those large scale campaigns, especially Black Energy and Energetic Bear. Okay? So you could see those as the first stage to get a foothold in, uh, in your adversary's uh, critical infrastructure um, for something that will most likely follow later. Um, so there is this, this cyber-physical aspect in there, uh, but so far 
it wasn't taken all the way to, um, to destruction. But the risk increased tremendously, as you would guess. I mean, if, if you consider that in your pipeline system, uh, in your um, um, uh, energy management systems, you have this malware sitting that, let's just say in a couple of weeks or in a couple of months, could turn into something destructive. I think uh, this is very concerning from a national security point of view. Are, are utilities doing enough to rid their systems of malware? Um, what is enough? It depends on your, on your angle to this. Uh, if you ask the utilities, well, you should ask Scott Aronson from EEI. I, I hope you next do. Last. Well, certainly the utilities um, will say, oh, certainly we're doing enough. And they have any right to tell you so because they have to pay the bill. So they're paying for that. And uh, the utilities in the private sector, I mean, um, they have to approach this from a business perspective. And at the same time, the government tells them, approach this from a business perspective. So if you think about the NIST cybersecurity framework, they, uh, the NIST CSF specifically factors in your business perspective, like your risk appetite. So. Um, the, um, the utilities had any right to tell us, yo, we are doing enough. Um, if you ask people uh, from the cybersecurity community, if you ask some people in, in DHS, maybe they will tell you, oh, they, they could probably do better. But let's not forget, this is a, um, this is a, um, a big challenge, and it's going to cost, or it does cost money already, and it's going to cost more money if we want to make it happen. It's not just a technology issue. So I would say that we have the technology available to make critical infrastructure reasonably cyber secure. We can do that. It's not rocket science. But the, the big question, the, the elephant in the room is, who wants to pay for that? Do you want to pay for that? Do you want to pay for that? Well, maybe not. Huh? Uh, well, but somebody has to. and. Um, that's always the, the fundamental problem that we dance around on, uh, about. It's cybersecurity never comes for free. That's an illusion. You have to pay the price. And that price can be a, a higher a purchase price. It can be uh, less convenience, less flexibility. Convenience is a, is a huge driver of cyber insecurity. Um, and until we accept this as a fact and, and re reshift our priorities, um, are willing to pay for our cybersecurity, security, not much is going to change. So uh, you, you talked about convenience. And one of the things yeah. that is driving the IoT, the IIoT um, industry 4.0 is convenience, right? Exactly. So um, are, there, are there parts of critical infrastructure utilities where we shouldn't be putting devices that connect to the open net, the internet or networked at all? Well, I would think so. Uh, but, so let's just briefly consider what are the, the super critical high value targets that you should never connect to the internet. Nuclear power plants, that is pretty much obvious to me. Uh, then those, uh, if, if you rethink that mesh, you know, that, that, uh, those superstructures. The few um, single points of, of global failure that are in there. We, we have to identify these. One thing that, one area that's completely overlooked uh, is chemical plants. Uh, I have a hard time imagining why, because uh, this is something that the media should rub into Congress's face every now and then. That's the big thing. How many uh, times have you heard the, the term uh, cyber 9-11? I think Panetta brought it up. Uh, well, how do you kill 3,000 people with a cyber attack? Certainly not by shutting down the electric grid. I can tell you how. By blowing up a, a chemical plant uh, that happens to, to store or process uh, toxic gas. So uh, what, what we should discuss is something like a cyber Bhopal. Uh, this is what really drives me nuts because uh, little is done in that sector. Most people are under the complete illusion that, oh, they got safety systems. I think I educated you about safety systems a couple of minutes ago. Safety does not factor in security. Please get that into your heads. This is, a, this is, a, is a important and, and imminent challenge. We have to marry these concepts rather soon. 
we have to bring together safety and security. Um, so that's what I believe uh, we need to do. Those high value targets never must be connected to, uh, to the internet and they don't have to. But certainly I, I think everybody will be able to, st to understand a simple thing. Nobody connects um, a factory, um, a home appliance to the internet in order to become more secure. It's always for some other reason, like getting additional functionality, getting additional convenience. Well, uh, let me uh, pull out a, a, a bizarre example that I just read uh, the other day in, in some media outlet. Well, imagine uh, you will be able, um, when, when you want to mm, shut down your lights at home, you just need to tell Siri, Siri, please turn down the lights. Um, okay, will that make you more secure? No. Is that convenient? Well, if you, you could tell me. I, I love the idea, but uh, that, that comes with a price, okay? It comes with a security price. It, it will also not be good for your health because um, you need the exercise, you know, get off your, your chair every now and then. You may have just turned off someone's lights at home. But um, so I wonder, a lot have been talked, talked about post, again, going back to Stuxnet and sort of what that unleashed. Uh, from your point of view, did that start a cyber arms race? Absolutely. How often have you heard uh, the, the phrase, um, Stuxnet was a wake-up call? If you um, look back in history, I think Jay Healy once did, uh, mapped all the wake-up calls in cyber that we had. I think it was the ninth wake-up call. And then uh, Ukraine was the tenth. So we had lots of wake-up calls. Uh, unfortunately, um, political decision makers, um, um, business decision makers just didn't hear those wake-up calls. But there was some group who heard the wake-up call, and that's the military. So uh, what we have seen, if, if anybody woke up, it was um, the military realm. And uh, as you may know, after Stuxnet, um, the U.S heavily increased their spending on, uh, on cyber warfare. Um, cyber Command was uh, founded or, or went operational after Stuxnet. Um, Stuxnet was not done by U.S. Cyber Command. It, wasn't, it didn't exist at the time. So the United States invested heavily, but others invested as well. So my, I think my, the latest count was at, at this time, we have more than 100 nation states with known um, offensive cyber activities. And uh, that is of concern because cyber warfare is so much cheaper than uh, kinetic warfare. So even the, excuse the language, shittiest country down in Africa, or, no, um, you know, I don't have anything against Africa, but just pick your favorite country or area that you don't like. Um, <laughs> they would be capable of, um, of building up their cyber army. And as you may know, uh, they do that. Like Yemen has their cyber army. Um, Syria has their cyber army. Tunisia has their cyber army. They could never afford um, a modern fighter jet fleet, a tank fleet, uh, like a modern tank fleet. Um, so this was a, a big, big game changer. So what, in your view then, what would be an act of cyber war? Uh, to tell you, uh, to be honest, I don't think that cyber war is really a good term or a useful term. I think uh, cyber warfare is, uh, is a, a term that we need to, to use. But cyber war as such um, has, been, um, has raised some, some absurd fantasies like um, there is a cyber-only war. I, I don't see that happening. Because once that you get serious, so that, that your, your consequence, that you are um, able and willing to actually inflict on your adversary, then there will most likely also be a kinetic response. So I, I cannot imagine uh, a real-world international conflict that is cyber-only. And I mean, the, the US has made it pretty clear in their cyber strategy that they uh, de reserve the right to respond kinetically. Well, uh, and, and you have to for a simple reason. Let's just assume uh, some, uh, some years down the road, a country like Yemen or Afghanistan launches uh, a, a huge cyber attack against your critical infrastructure. 
that you cannot do very much with, with all your cyber weapons against Yemen or Afghanistan because you know they are basically in the Stone Age. Um, so you really need your kinetic weapons in order to strike back. Um, so again, I don't like the, the term cyber war, but what we are seeing, which probably comes close, is now the, um, the escalation of, um, or the, the use of, of cyber attacks in order uh, or to coerce, uh, to make a strong, robust argument. Like, uh, guys, we really didn't like that picture about dictator Kim Jong-un. So, and then we, this, that's why we did the attack, the cyber attack against Sony. Um, or uh, if you think about Ukraine again, we really, really, uh, really disliked uh, you Ukrainians toppling uh, transmission pylons uh, that transported the electricity to Crimea. So, uh, you know, here's our tit for tat. We are seeing that at an increasing level. Um, and I think uh, this is just the beginning. So. Uh, I, I recently said uh, what we see today is like the teenage years of cyber conflict. Uh, like it, it's uh, characterized by rude, immature, experimental, aggressive behavior. So those with, with the muscle, they are simply acting like teenagers. They are checking out what they can do. Okay? Unfortunately, I, I think that's the case. But, uh, but um, this is just the beginning. I'm, uh, I believe what we're going to see in the future is two developments. So at some point in time, some of these um, rude tit-for-tat attacks will just go out of hand and will uh, probably trigger a much bigger international crisis. And at the, at, at the other side of the spectrum, I'm very confident that rather soon you'll see increased efforts to arrive at international uh, treaties, agreements on how to actually um, uh, handle this whole new emerging field. But just remember, you can only um, negotiate with rational actors. Uh, for example, you would not most likely not be able to negotiate with North Korea. You would not want to negotiate with ISIS. So there, there is this uh, gray and black zone uh, that, uh, that will make um, uh, cyber warfare negotiations, cyber arms uh, um, treaties uh, very difficult. So we've hit on a lot of topics uh, from critical infrastructure to uh, vulnerabilities to cyber warfare. Uh, I want to bring in the audience to see if anyone here has questions. Yeah. So There's one up front. One sec, to bring a mic, right, microphone over to you. Thanks, Mr. Langer, for the great talk and perspective. Uh, I had a question. You, you mentioned about modeling and analytics and less yes. being done on that. Could you elaborate on that? OK, so um, just imagine, oh, let me, let me get back. What we are looking at is an engineering challenge. It's not something where uh, we need to do lots of discovery. So, a cyber physical attack basically involves engineering because uh, you don't want to crash a system. You want to manipulate physical behavior of what, uh, just call it a physical object. I, I gave you my point of view. I think objects in the industrial realm is probably not appropriate. So we, we refer to those as actuators. So um, you want to manipulate the behavior of that specific target, okay? Now at this point, you turn yourself into an engineer because if, if you're good at it, you also want reliability, right? Just like the good guys, you don't want your weapon to fail. It's gotta be reliable because otherwise your boss will tell you, man, you, you did a shitty job on that. It, it didn't go off. Reliability, so I, I refer to that as, as cyber physical attack engineering. So it, in, it involves the, the physical engineering part, you need to understand the physical process, you need to understand the equipment, you need to understand the dependencies, and then you need to bring in the cyber side of it, which is uh, control systems 101. Now the, the only thing that you would have to add is how can you go into the trust chain. But this means that you ha have to identify the trust chain in the first place, which isn't overly difficult in the industrial space. So just to, to be a bit, a bit more specific, uh, what most people don't know, how 
how um, simple and static industrial control systems environments are. We have some very critical um, nodes in such a network, and those are what we call to the engineering systems or the engineering servers. Engineering means this is the machine where uh, an electrical engineer or a process engineer um, configures the control logic, and this is uh, which is then deterministically um, uh, affecting what the actuators are doing. Okay, so I, I hope I'm get, not getting too technical here. So uh, we, we know right away those engineering systems, oh, they, they are uh, great targets. We, we want to sit on those engineering servers. Once that, once that you have managed to achieve that, you're almost there. So remember Stuxnet? The, the compromise was on the engineering systems. And then they were in the trust chain, okay? Once you are uh, in that position, there is basically nothing that could stop you. Because the uh, control systems, which is the last mile before the physical stuff, guess what? They don't have any authorization and authentication, etc. They are unable to detect any malicious bits and bytes. So when you are there, it's already too late. Um, I just want to give you the idea, we can model that, certainly we can. We, we model so, many, so much more complex things. Well, you know, you can model complete cities with the behavior of the people who live there and when do they turn the lights on and off, blah, blah, blah. All that we can model. Uh, we were talking, if, if, if you just think about size. Um, the, uh, the average um, factory probably depending on well, automotive factories are a little bit larger, but, but the average chemical plant um, has around 500, 700 um, control systems and uh, associated components, RTUs, etc. So we are talking less than 1,000. Um, the behavior of the physical objects is much less entropical. So, I mean, you can only do so much with the, with the motor, for example. So the, the major parameter is the speed of the motor, right? So you get the point, this can be modeled. And I have a hard time figuring out why, why so few people are actually doing that. We do that all the time. Because this is how you can predict, or first you can identify those structural cyber-physical vulnerabilities and you can predict the damage. And this is good for offense as well as for defense, because once that you have identified those very nasty structural or cyber-physical vulnerabilities, certainly you have a, a great angle at uh, protecting those, those uh, systems. Anyone else? Questions for Mr. Langer? Hello. There we go. There go. Great talk, Ralph. Um, Paul Roberts from Security Ledger. Uh, a couple questions I wanted to ask, but let me try and pick the better one. Um, so the, this week we had um, an announcement of a major vulnerability in a Schneider Electric system, the ProView, I think, which was one of these engineering workstations that you were yeah. talking about where you yeah. create the ladder logic yeah. and then upload yeah. it. Um, so, uh, you know, when you read into that, it seems like n not a lot of security around the ability of people to kind of send instructions to that um, system that would end, that, that you could implant malicious code into and have yeah. the machine execute it. Schneider subsequently came out and said that they were going to introduce a new, um, basically automatic update uh, service for some of their customers to push out patches and so on. So I guess the question is, is that the way we s you see things going where vendors like a Siemens or a Schneider might start to more closely mirror kind of Microsoft or Apple in the way that they manage their customers' systems with, you know, pushing out updates, um, you know, kind of, do you want to apply it now or do you want to yeah. apply it later tonight? Yeah. Or is that model not going to work in this context. Yeah, well, I, I believe that the whole idea of uh, you just patch your way out of the risk is complete nonsense in the factory automation space. And as a matter of fact, most asset owners are not doing it for a couple of reasons. Unfortunately, we don't have enough time left, so I can only give you two or three reasons. Um, first, what I, I think very important point, what everybody needs to know, 
the most nasty vulnerabilities in that space, in the cyber-physical space, won't be patched. Please get that into your heads. The patches that you're talking about only affect the, the low-level, insignificant shit. Excuse me. <laughs> so why, why, is, why, why I'm uh, using that language? Because the, the real issues won't get patched. Those systems are insecure by design. Since you mentioned Schneider, let me give you an, an example. Uh, Schneider uh, was in the news recently because somebody figured out, well, for some products, they uh, support automated firmware updates via SNMP. SNMP? Uh, wasn't that the network management protocol? And they were using it to do firmware updates? Isn't that a vulnerability? Oh, you bet it is. Uh, no, now here's the point. It's an intentional product feature. Somebody figured out, well, how cool is that? We don't need to use a, a new protocol. Or we just use SNMP. Everybody is using SNMP. So if, if we simply allow the firmware updates via SNMP, that's the most convenient thing for the asset owners and for ourselves. Uh, a, a, a cybersecurity person would probably call that SNMP tunneling. Like you're just abusing a protocol with a precisely defined purpose in order to do something that comes with a much, much higher risk. And that's a typical problem in that space, okay? All the nasty vulnerabilities are deliberate design features. Let me give you another example. The, the vast majority of uh, industrial control systems, RTUs, etc., are using a protocol that's called Modbus. In Modbus, there is no authentication and authorization, which means once that you're able to talk to the end device, you can manipulate the end device in, ever, in whatever way you want, okay? That is a design feature. And um, the industry, the vendors, are now are discussing for a decade that they probably should uh, start defining a, a, a more secure protocol. But they are, you know, they are trying to wait another couple of years in order to reach a consensus, etc. And this is funny in a way, because uh, in, in that space we don't see a lot of innovation. When the Modbus protocol was invented in the 80s by a company called Modicon, it was a quick and dirty job. If, if you know how protocols work, you can literally tell that somebody was probably doing that um, at a, um, at a, uh, because he was bored over the weekend. So it was, it, it was just a quick and dirty job. And this is now the, pro it was then ported to TCP IP, and this is the protocol that is used to access the majority of industrial control systems on the world. So please um, don't think too much about that we will be able to patch our way out of the problem. There is one, one um, idea I would like to finish with. Um, the, the worst thing you could do is automated updates, automated patches. So that's, that, that's the risk in its own right. And if you want to think a little bit bigger here, just imagine for everyone who is doing automated patches, who is doing automated patches? Oh, come on, you all do. You all do. <laughs> but but I, I, I'm glad that I obviously made you a little bit think twice about that. One of our worst case scenarios is in the future, somebody um, is able to compromise Microsoft's uh, certificates. So just imagine what a vulnerability that would be, what, what an exploit vector. If you are able to, pos to position yourself in Microsoft's patches, just imagine how many million computers you can compromise at once. Ah, that's a, that's a biggie. That's a big national security risk. That may be a wake-up call number 10. Sure. No, 11, that's, <laughs> that, that, that would be 11. So I think we have time for one more question. We have one. Well, um, thanks very much, Ralph. It My was pleasure. a pleasure. Um, thanks to Ralph.